Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the Foundation for a Smoke Free World Economics webinar series. While um, all of you are gathering, thank you for participating. I am Patricia Kovacevic, I'm an attorney and regulatory expert, and it is my great pleasure to moderate today's event on graphic images on cigarette packages, prices, and tobacco choices. David Janazzo, Executive Vice President and Co-President of the Foundation, will open the webinar, followed by two outstanding professors and researchers who will be introduced in detail in due course. If you join late, no worries, replays of the entire webinar will be posted on YouTube. Allow me now to turn the spotlight on David, who will introduce himself and the webinar. David. Good day, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is David Janazzo. I am the interim co-president uh, with the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And we welcome you and our distinguished colleagues uh, to further explore uh, this topic relating to the economics of ending the smoking epidemic. The foundation is prioritizing work in this area. Uh, you will note, and there's plenty of information on our website, uh, the foundation posted its strategic plan uh, for the uh, three-year period, uh, clearly identifying a research objective to educate about the economics associated with tobacco harm reduction and to increase awareness. Uh, last week, the foundation posted five requests for proposals, uh, one of them uh, entitled Impact of Policies and Regulations on Tobacco Harm Reduction in Low and Middle Income Countries. So this is an area of focus uh, for, for the foundation. We're pleased to, to, to uh, bring uh, to you our uh, recognized experts in the field. We're equally pleased to call Cornell and Dr. Matthew's research partners of, of the foundation to, to further the body of research in this area. And we hope that you find this webinar helpful. Patricia. Thank you, David. Um, and now from Cornell University College of Human Ecology, Professor Matthews will present an important study he co-authored with several other researchers, including Professor Kenko. By way of introduction, Alan Matthews is a professor in policy analysis and management and a commissioner for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. He currently serves on the executive committee and corporate secretary of MSCHE. He served as dean of the College of Human Ecology and the senior associate dean for academic affairs and undergraduate education for the College of Human Ecology. Professor Matthews is co-editor of the Journal of Consumer Policy, and he is on the editorial boards of the Journal on Consumer Affairs and the Journal of Public Policy and Marketing. He came to Cornell following a career at the Federal Trade Commission, where he served as a staff economist in the Division of Economic Policy Analysis and was recognized with the Outstanding Scholarship Award, the Excellence in Economics Award, and the Award for Superior Service to the FTC. A major focus of his research is the effect um, on of Food and Drug Administration regulatory policies on consumer and firm behavior. Following Professor Matthias's presentation, our second distinguished guest, Dr. Clark Nardinelli, will provide his brief analysis of the study. Clark Nardinelli holds a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. After his academic career, Dr. Nardinelli joined the US FDA um, in 1995 and remained at the agency until retiring. He served as a supervisor economist most of that time and as FDA chief economist for his last 13 years at FDA. In that role, he supervised benefit and cost analyses, research projects, and policy analyses of all products regulated by the FDA. Dr. Nardinelli assessed major new regulations in a variety of areas. He also worked extensively on deregulation during the Trump administration. While at FDA, his research dealt with food safety and nutrition labeling, drug warning labels, 
prescription drug approvals and benefit cost analysis of health and safe, safety regulations and policies, among other. Um, in 2019, Dr. Marginelli was president of the Society of Benefit Cost Analysis. At present, he continues to follow developments in health and safety regulations and benefit cost analysis. As a reminder, we will take questions at the end of the presentations, which you may type in the Q&A box. Kindly wait until the end of the presentations to post your questions. Our guest speakers may answer them if possible in the remaining time. Without further ado, I'm uh, turning um, the floor to Professor Matthias. Welcome again and yielding the floor to you. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna start sharing screen and get my presentation ready to go. Can, every, can people see the screen? Excellent. Um, perfect. So um, I'm really excited to be um, presenting this work. This is um, work that has been funded through a grant to Cornell University by the Foundation for Smoke Free World. And so we acknowledge that support in our, in our um, disclosure there. I wanna thank my co-author, Don Kenkel, who's the principal investigator on, on the award from the Foundation for Smoke-Free World. And the, the grant has allowed us to build a phenomenal research team with, with graduate students, as well as um, research associates. And so my, our co-authors have, have been great collaborators on this. So the title of my talk is The Impact of Graphic Warnings Appearing on Cigarette Packages on Cigarette, E-Cigarette, um, and Quit Decisions. We're going to focus on adult smokers in this, in, in, our, in our data and try to understand what is likely to happen when the FDA um, actions about requiring tobacco companies to put um, these graphic new graphic warning labels on all cigarette packages in the US, what's likely to happen to consumer choices um, and, and, and project based on our discrete choice experiments. So here are the goals of our study to use a discrete choice model to understand again, how the new graphic labeling requirement will affect cigarette um, and cigarette prices, cigarette, e-cigarette prices, and how all of that will combine to affect people's choices. Um, we're gonna explore the mechanisms responsible for the impacts we identify. So for example, if the graphic images impact Cigarette choices, e-cigarette choice, so quit behavior. Why did it, how, what mechanism was it responsible for that action? Was it new knowledge about these risks or was it fear and disgust about how the label affects our emotions? We're gonna to try to distinguish those. This also will set the stage for our future work. So by having a stated preference model, since these graphic images aren't there yet, we're using a stated preference model. So people are gonna to have to anticipate what they would do once we, sh once we show them these, these labels. And that will allow us in the future to compare stated preference models with actual revealed preference models when the labels show up and we'll be able to examine what actually happened when they're actually there. So that's a great advantage of having pre-data and post-data. And we have a grant request to, to look at that um, once the graphic images start showing up. We also wanna use these estimates to monitorize the graphic image impact. Since we'll have the effect of prices on these choices, we'll be able to compare what a, a price increase would have to be to get the same impact as putting these graphic images on the, on the um, packages, which will allow for interesting cost benefit analysis for us to do in the future. And finally, we wanna use our experience and what we have learned in conducting this DCE to initiate new experiments. And in fact, we're currently in the field looking at um, a DCE focused on what will happen if the FDA bans menthol cigarettes. And we're gonna do the same type of analysis, banning menthol cigarettes, how will that likely impact smoking decisions, e-cigarette decisions and quit behavior. And then in our future research, we are hoping to use consumer willingness to pay for cigarette carrying containers to estimate how smokers' disutility from having to see graphic images once 
once they're there. In Europe, carrying cases are quite popular. And so this is not that popular in the US. Will graphic images start causing consumers to purchase new, new things to sort of not have to look at those images? So that sort of sets the stage for our future work. We're gonna take you through the legal history of cigarette graphic warnings. Overview, very quick overview of the literature on graphic warnings. And then we most of the presentation will be real, will be a focus on our discrete choice model where consumers will have where our participants will have to choose, faced with scenarios, whether they want to continue smoking cigarettes, choose an e-cigarette, or actually quit both. We'll go through the design of the DCE, the scenarios we present to our participants and the estimation technique we use to estimate the impacts of cigarette prices, e-cigarette prices, and the graphic image on our on choices. We're gonna, again, we're gonna focus on those results specifically. We actually have many other factors and scenario manipulations in our DCE. Those numbers will show up in our presentation, but we're not focusing on that in this study. So, in June 9, 2009, shows you how long regulations take to actually get implemented, President Obama signs the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Act. The law provides the FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products, and this included implementing graphic health warning labels on cigarette packages. And the legislation, the congressional action, actually dictated that the warning labels would appear on the top 50% both sides of cigarette packages with text in at least 17 point font and color graphic representations of the health consequences of smoking. So very detailed legislation around the formatting and, and the very details about, about the labels themselves. I'm not being able to advance, oh, there we go, okay. In June, 2011, the FDA publicly released nine approved graphic warning labels approved by the FDA is what they would like to see, each featuring a full color graphic image and, and a corresponding text associated with that, that image. The labels tended to focus on health consequences associated with smoking, including death, disease, and the complications with pregnancy and delivery. This was immediately challenged by RJR Reynolds Tobacco Company and they were objecting to the format and the content of the proposed warning labels as a violation of their rights to commercial speech in marketing a legal product. Central to the court case was the doctrine on commercial speech, which outlines under what conditions government can force firms to put labels on their products. And in this, and the history here is that courts typically rely on precedent set on, under two quite different Supreme Court cases with respect to commercial forced speech. Those two cases are the Zatterer case and the Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corp case. And I'll take you through very quickly the themes of both of those precedents. In the Zauder standard, the ruling is interpreted as limiting the ability of government to force speech, which is the same as forcing these labels on their products, to situations when there is misleading or deceptive information in, in the speech. This establishes a rational consumer deception standard for imposing speech, much like the FTC regulates advertising in the first place. And the government then may mandate speech if it corrects a potentially deceptive message. The Central Hudson case is a broader view of what when the government can actually force speech. It establishes a multi-factor test for the constitutional protection of commercial speech, but it's not limited only to correcting deception. Instead, it must show the forced speech advances a substantial government interest. The solution, the, spe the forced speech directly addresses that interest. And most importantly, and most, uh, and, and, and presents a lot of complex legal action, it may not be more extensive than necessary. You can see that this is a lawyer's dream in some sense, um, lots of litigation about what is more extensive than necessary. So 
in the RJ in the in the in the litigation, the legal question focused on whether the forced speech improved knowledge or was directly trying to advocate a government position that individuals should not smoke. If it's improving knowledge, it's more about the Zatterer um, standard um, precedent. But if it's about the government taking a position, it's more about the Central Hudson case. And so these are this is why I took you through those two, those two different precedents. In the end, to summarize, and this I could do a whole a whole seminar on this, the court determined that the labels were not constitutional and believed that they were designed to evoke an emotional response in order to get consumers not to start smoking or to stop smoking. And so the FDA had the choice. This was a federal district court. The FDA had the, dis the decision whether to appeal this or to reconsider. Instead of appealing, the US government revisited the labels and drafted new proposed images. And we, in our study, are gonna empirically analyze one of these. These new proposed labels move the stated goal away from reduced smoking and towards simply informing consumers about lesser known health risks. So much more focus on knowledge provision rather than changing behavior. This is more aligned with a consumer deception standard suggesting the Zatterer standard rather than the central Hudson standard might be the appropriate precedent that the courts will use. Here are the new warning labels that FDA is proposing and I won't take you through all of them. We're gonna focus in our study on the one with the arrow right here. Smoking reduces blood flow to the limbs, which, re which can require amputation. So again, the logic of this is that blood flow, reduced blood flow to the limbs is, may not be one of the most known health risks. And FDA, again, is focusing on the less known ones. Here, is, here are the, uh, the images that go along with those, those um, warnings. And so again, we're gonna focus on this one with the amputated toes with the actual wording of the text, reducing blood flow to the limbs. Um, several of these, um, the, in the litigation, this one, the one we analyze, and some of the other more graphic, gross looking ones are the ones that are, are the focus of legal, um, continued legal um, action, because again, the tobacco companies are arguing and continue to argue that these labels continue to violate their commercial free speech rights. So again, opponents of new labels argue that the requ required warnings proposed by FDA are not factual about less known health risks, but they are shocking and inflammatory and are intended to convey emotions of fear, shame, and disgust. So our work will focus on the image of these diseased feet with amputated toes and examine whether this impact, the image in fact impacts our choices to start with. And if so, is it through changes in knowledge about blood flow or through changes in fear and disgust? And we're gonna measure those. There's a long literature on graphic images. Um, I, I could spend a whole lecture on all, all of these. The, the, the way I would summarize the literature as my understanding based on lots of reading is there are a couple of broad sort of meta-analyses of these. Some of the, one of the meta-analyses was focused on the actual observational data on behavior. Those studies tend to give very mixed results. And usually this is across different countries that actually have implemented images. Some show impact, some don't show impact. Very, very unclear when you look at observational data after the fact. In studies and in, in meta-analyses of studies that look at experimental designs, showing people the warning labels and asking them their reactions to them, we find significant impacts typically on, the, on what we call the antecedents of behavioral change. So we find things on attention and recall of the labels, attitudes and beliefs, behavioral intentions. So yes, I, I think I would likely quit and perceived effectiveness. Those are the 10, we, we tend to find more, more significant results there, especially on the first two. Behavioral intentions are less consistent than the intention and recall and attitudes and beliefs. So that's sort of where the literature is. Our contribution to our knowledge 
there are no studies that focus on the impact of graphic images appearing on cigarette packages on e-cigarette choices. And the reason we're focusing on e-cigarette choices is one could imagine it going either way. On the one hand, showing graphic images on cigarette packages might say e-cigarettes are less harmful because the image is about the, the effect of smoking cigarettes. On the other hand, consumers might apply and take any image about cigarette smoking and think it affects all tobacco use. And so it might deter e-cigarette choice as well. So we have not seen any studies that try to distinguish this and estimate this. So we're very excited about this aspect of the study, the graphic image on e-cigarettes. We're also excited about this work because most of the work on, on labels tend to be very experimental where you again bring, bring participants in, you show them a label, and then you ask them about their intended behavior, but you don't force them into choice situations. And so we believe that the DCE may better approximate actual behavioral responses compared to these very um, defined experiments where people are just reporting on what they think they would do. We're actually asking them to make hypothetical choices rather than just asking them what they think they might do without seeing different choices and things like that. We also study whether the graphic images influence choices of cigarettes and e-cigarettes and quitting by changing again, the knowledge of the risk feature in the image or through other mechanisms such as the fear and disgust. So here is the manipulation we're gonna do is we're gonna show half our sample, this warning label, the one that we, we talked about before and half our sample are largely gonna see that one of the current Surgeon General's warnings, and we chose this one to use in the warning that we present to, to people. So the very sort of very minimalist Surgeon General warning and the, the graphic images. So here's our DCE. After showing a respondent a scenario, we ask them about their immediate choice they will make, as well as the choice they would make six months from now. We have not seen DCEs that both focus on exactly the choice you're going to make now and then what your intended choice would be six months from now, because we know intentions to quit in the future are much higher than actual quits immediately. So we're going to be able to examine some of that in, in our empirical work. Um, we're going to manipulate several aspects of the scenario. So we're going to allow three we're going to manipulate prices, cigarette prices. So we're going to, in the scenarios, consumers, um, participants will see one of three cigarette prices, one of three e-cigarette prices, one of four e-cigarette warnings that will be on the e-cigarette warning. We're focusing, um, again, we're not going to focus that on this study, just to give you a flavor of what our future work will be. Three different possible flavor scenarios. So how the availability of flavors, are menthol flavors available, are candy, fruit, those types of flavors available, or just tobacco flavors. And then the, the nicotine level availability of e-cigarettes. So uh, are all nicotine levels available, some limited nicotine levels with caps on them, et cetera, what, what you can buy. When we set up our DCE, we set the scenario by saying, imagine you coming into a store where you buy your, tip, your typical cigarettes and you will have um, this choice of, of buying, of continuing to smoke your cigarette, purchasing a cigarette, purchasing an e-cigarette or quitting both. And I'll show you the setup in a, in a second. 600 US respondents assigned to the graphic image warning and 600 US respondents assigned to the textual warning. The reason we put the word US there is we've run DCEs across many countries. Um, and so that's why this one, we want to just focus on the US. We have determined that with, with consultation with the external firm, SSRS, we determined that 12 scenarios was about the maximum a single respondent could stay attentive to. So each respondent is going to see 12 different scenarios with these variable amounts of cigarette prices, e-cigarette prices, et cetera. 
um, as we ask them to make their choice. And this summarizes the DCE perfectly, we think. So here is, a, is one scenario that a respondent will see. Again, all adult smokers, they will see this scenario and they'll see the product cigarettes versus e-cigarettes versus um, neither. So I would quit smoking cigarettes and not e-cigarettes. And we're gonna ask them to choose one of these three um, choices. And the variables they'll see is the price of the US, the price of the cigarette, the price of the e-cigarette, the nicotine content. Um, and again, we're not gonna focus on nicotine content and flavor. And then half the respondents will see this warning label um, and they'll see a, a warning label on the e-cigarettes. So we're really, again, focused in this study on the, the difference in the choices made between people seeing this and people seeing this. This is with the current Surgeon General's warning. The previous one is with the um, graphic image, okay? Um, another interesting aspect of our study is that for the e-cigarette price manipulations, we, have, we did a market analysis and chose the price of an e-cigarette to be about the national price for a typical e-cigarette um, e cigarette product without the hardware. So this is about the sort of the refills um, that we, it's very complicated to figure out exactly what the price of an e-cigarette should be. So we did a lot of work thinking about that. And so the three scenarios are um, about the national average price in the US of an e-cigarette. Then some people, then in some scenarios, they'll see double that price. And in some scenarios, they'll see half the price. So in this scenario, the $2 would be the half the price. Um, for the cigarette price, we actually use the last, the price of the, of the cigarette package they last purchased. And so that price will vary by individuals. And we take that price and we double it and we have it in the, in the, in the, in the scenarios that, consumer, that the participants will see. That will allow us to do some interesting behavioral analysis because for some, twice the price of what they currently pay might be equal to the current price someone else is paying if they're in, for example, a different, since this is a nationally representative sample, some will be in low tax states so that they're starting and paying less. So when we double that price for them, it's about the average, it's about the actual price someone else paid in a higher, tax state. So we'll be able to look at anchoring issues and pricing and things like that. Not the focus of this study, but something we'll be able to do as well, which we're excited about. So we construct an empirical model of this choice. So again, we have three choices here of a smoker's choice between cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and quitting. We use the basic McFadden standard random utility model where consumers get utility by by what they choose. And um, the utility can be composed, decomposed into the representative utility. It can be explained by the observed alternative attributes that we present to them and an unobserved random utility model. So the individual chooses the alternative that, pro that provides the highest utility. That is, chooses the alternative J, and we only have three choices here. If and only if the utility from choosing, for, for example, the e-cigarette is higher than choosing quitting or the cigarette. Hence, from that, we can derive the probability that an individual, uh, a particular person in our sample chooses a particular alternative J, the e-cigarette, the cigarette, or, or quitting. Um, based on this derivation, the most widely used assumption is that the error term here, the, the random component, is um, distributed in a certain way, which will allow a closed form solution to, to give us a logit specification of the choice probability. And so again, I'm going through this um, relatively quickly. So for each choice, you can derive a probability that's determined by the individual um, factors that a person sees. And we estimate the beta that comes that will that will come with that will the parameter estimates on each of the factors. So the cigarette price is an x factor, the price the the 
the e-cigarette price, the cigarette price, and the warning label are the three betas that we're going to be focus on, focusing on. Um, so we'll get a beta estimates on those three parameters for each choice, the probability that someone chooses a cigarette, continues to choose the cigarette, the probability that someone chooses an e-cigarette, and the probability that someone um, decides to quit. Notice the denominators here are all scaled the same. So it's the numerator that sort of drives this logic choice. In, we're not presenting this, um, but we do continually more sophisticated manipulations of the estimation. We do, we first will show you just linear probability models of each of these choices to, because the interpretation is simple. We do multinomial logit models of all three of these together. And then we do random coefficient models where we actually allow the betas to be um, varied by individual and do simulation models based on assumed distributions of, of the betas across all people. We're only going to focus in this presentation on the linear probability models so that we'll be able to just say, if a cigarette price goes up by a dollar, what is the probability that the um, respondent chose a cigarette, an e-cigarette, or chose to quit, and a person exposed to this, the warning label, um, how did that affect the probability for each of these three choices? So again, the X vector focuses on the image, the graphic image, the price of e-cigarettes, and the price of cigarettes. As I mentioned, we vary the nicotine content, flavor availability, and warnings on e-cigarettes, but not the focus of this paper. Given the three equations, as I said, shown, it's a multinomial logic model. Take the simple approach and do a linear probability model. Again, different levels of sophistication. We keep working on getting more sophistication in, in our estimation technique. But what we're finding in the multinomial logic, very similar results to the linear probability models. And we're just now working on these mixed logic models which put, which again are, are allowing more flexibility on the estimates of the betas that we show you. So here's the bottom line on what we found in our, in our empirical work. Um, so again, we asked consumers to make those choices um, based on what they would do immediately if they walked into that store, store in, into a store, saw this scenario, what would they do? And then ask them to think about seeing the same scenario, what they would do six months from now. So we present both results separately um, for those two choices. So on the pictorial warning, we see very interesting results. We do see a large, so just to give you a sense, across all scenarios, about 58% of the sample chose cigarettes, 24% chose e-cigarettes, and 19% chose quit. Um, for the six months from now, 43% of the sample chose to a cigarette, 22% of the sample chose an e-cigarette, and 35% chose quit. So when you look at these parameter estimates, it's sort of useful to think of those, those levels to start with across all, all, across all scenarios. So for the pictorial warning, we see that for the 600 individuals exposed to both the graphic image, we see a decline in the probability of them choosing the cigarette. And interestingly, about half move to e-cigarettes and about half move to saying they would quit. So this is a relatively large impact given again, across all the sample, about 58% of the people well, across all scenarios shown choose cigarettes and so we, we see the warning move that, move that down quite a bit. And again, distributed them to e-cigarettes and quitting. In the six months from now, we see an even larger effect, which is not surprising because again, people anticipate quitting in the future. We see an even larger impact of the graphic image on people choosing, continue to choose cigarettes. So decline in cigarette smoking, but uh, all a little and, and again a bigger movement to ultimate quitting. One way to interpret that is that this is at least consistent with the story that e-cigarettes are thought of as a path to quitting, 
because we see a bigger movement to e-cigarettes immediately, and then ultimately six months from now, a bigger movement to, to quitting. Then on the cigarette price, we find very strong impacts. And the, 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 the scale of this is a dollar. So the price is measured in dollars. So a dollar increase in the cigarette price moves people away from cigarettes, not surprising, downward sloping demand curve. And we see that in fact, there's a cross price elasticity here in that a dollar increase in the cigarette price moves people towards e-cigarettes. And a dollar increase in the price of a cigarette moves people towards quitting as well. And it's again, interestingly, it's about an equal distribution from a price to e-cigarettes and to quitting. So the total effect on reduced smoking is, um, is the one, a probability reduction of, of 0 0.017, 0.09 to e-cigarettes, 0.008 to quit. Um, again, we find uh, um, prices are, are reasonably stable across the six month now versus the immediate choice. So we're not seeing that much difference between again, the six month intention and the immediate choice with respect to, with respect to the cigarette price. With respect to the e-cigarette price, we find um, again, strong price impacts. And what the most telling result here is that if e-cigarette prices go up, we see a movement back to cigarettes. So for again, these are adult smokers. If you raise in the scenario, the price of an e-cigarette, we see that cigarette choices go up and we see e-cigarette choices go down by about the same amount. So we see almost a one-to-one -one substitution for each dollar increase in a e-cigarette price with no impact on quitting in either the current immediate choice or the choice of six months from now. So what this would, from the policy perspective on this, if, if governments start raising taxes on e-cigarette prices and keep cigarette prices constant, and don't continue to raise cigarette prices, cigarette prices or cigarette taxes, we're gonna see movements back to, to cigarettes, at least in this hypothetical choice model that we, we have. So now the next step was to try to understand this pictorial warning. From this perspective, cigarette, um, if FDA is successful in, in finally getting those cigarette um, images on their cigarette packages, we expect lower rates of smoking, which is a good thing, um, potentially. And um, we want to understand the mechanism because the mechanism gets into this legal issue of whether the FDA will be able to successfully um, pass the legal requirements to not violate the commercial speech rights of firms. And so if it's imposing knowledge on consumers, then FDA is on sort of firmer ground from a constitutional perspective. If it's just creating emotional responses, they may run into the same issues that they ran into the legal, act, the legal issues with respect to their formal label um, attempts. So uh, we, I already talked about the policy relevant results of this. Um, so knowledge or fear. So to understand the knowledge or fear breakdown, um, we, we re-specify our models. So in our previous models, we had the choice, the cigarette choice, the e-cigarette choice, or the quitting choice was a function of the pictorial warning and the TCE manipulations. We re-specify our models and omit the pictorial warning variable and replace it with the variables that we believe the pictorial warning should influence. So those are the knowledge the fear and other harm perceptions that we think the labels might influence. So again, we take out the, the main effect and put in all the ways in which we believe the pictorial warning might influence the choice. So here's a little more formally, in our original equation, we had the choice as a function of the warning. Now we say, instead, the choice is a function of knowledge, fear, and the other DC attributes, just like in the previous specification. 
And we know that the pictorial image might impact knowledge, and we know the pictorial impact image might impact fear. So the total of, so we can break this down into the, the total derivatives here. So essentially we're working through the models that say, how does the impact, the, the image impact knowledge and how does that knowledge then in fact impact choice? How does the, how does the pictorial image in fact impact fear and how does fear impact choice? And so we can calculate these, these um, parameters um, as, a, and as a percentage of the total impact in our original model, okay? So here are the, here are the questions we use to get at fear and um, disgust versus knowledge. Think back to the scenarios that you were shown earlier in this study. In each of these scenarios, there was a warning label about smoking cigarettes. So this is right after they see all the scenarios. To what extent, if at all, did you feel disgust fear as a result of the labels? There are the choices on the knowledge one. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Smoking cigarettes reduces blood flow to the lower limbs. And do you agree with that? Now, remember that each participant has seen 12 different scenarios with that graphic image that says smoking cigarettes reduces blood flow to the lower limbs. So they've seen that 12 times, in fact, 24 times because when they see the scenario, it's presented again when we ask them about the choice six months from now. So they're really seeing this image constantly. So with the exact words of this. So here's what we found on the immediate choice variable, disgust fear, the, the impact of the disgust fear, we see large impacts of um, people of choosing cigarettes as a function of this fear amount. So for example, um, did you feel disgust fear about the graphic image? If you said to a great extent, we see that that greatly reduced the cigarette choice, increased the e-cigarette choice and increased quit. Same for six months from now. And for people who really didn't get disgusted by this image, we saw reductions um, um, as well, but much, much lower um, reduction. So again, this, this large coefficient to, on, to a great extent shows that fear seems to be driving choices. And what we find is that the pictorial warning actually generated um, um, quite a bit of fear because if those who saw the pictorial warning um, had to a greater extent said they, they were fearful and disgust. So this shows that the, the pictorial warning, those who were not, um, did not seem to react with fear and disgust, we see that um, the pictorial warning um, um, drove, um, drove this strong impact on their, their images of fear. Okay, so again, pictorial warning to a lot, to a great extent, we see a, a big impact there. On the knowledge, we see very little. So remember, people are exposed to this label 24 times, essentially seeing blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. And yet, when we ask, does blood flow affect your choices? We see very little impact of knowledge on choices. So just a, a few, a little bit on, on this one, but nothing on strongly agreeing with this. We see no impact on those people believe, believe that blood flow to low limbs strongly agree with that, very little impact on their choices. But we also find that the pictorial warning really didn't change their knowledge of reducing blood flow. So we see very little impact of this total big effect of the, of the pictorial warning, very large impact that original beta on pictorial warning. We see very little of that impact flowing through the pictorial warning, changing views of whether smoking reduces blood flow to the lower limbs. And in the previous example, that even having that knowledge changes choices very much. As opposed, going back to the fear and disgust, we find that pictorial warning drives 
to a great extent, people being fearful and disgust for, disgusting of, 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 uh, in reaction to the label. And in fact, that disgust driving um, the choices. So this puts um, FDA in a very um, interesting situation. Their goal of those new labels was to educate consumers about the knowledge of less known health risks and the way it's impacting choice on these hypothetical choices, at least, is not through changing knowledge, but through changing fear and disgust. Um, we've thought very hard about what this means, and it gets at very tough, I would think, philosophical questions of what do we mean by knowledge? Is fear and disgust a form of knowledge in some way? These are all questions that are way beyond our expertise, but FDA is going to have to, in the continual legal challenges to its, its graphic, putting graphic images on, on cigarette packages, it's going to have to grapple with these types of results um, because if it's all working through fear and disgust, they're going to face more significant challenges in passing constitutionality is our take on these results. So in summary, we find prices matter in choices. If governments start taxing e-cigarettes aggressively and make and, and keep cigarette taxes where they are, we're gonna see a movement back into cigarette choices away from e-cigarettes and not change quick behavior very much. So that, that's the main takeaway from the price impact. And on the pictorial warning, um, in pictorial warnings may very well matter um, but it's going to be through fear and disgust. And when finally, if it is through fear and disgust, we have to worry about for those who continue to smoke, which is the majority of people, how does this disgust and fear um, generate disutility for them because they're still smoking and now they have to look at this very graphic image. This is an interesting question for government for cost benefit analysis, which we hope to take and examine both through the purchasing of those, of those carrying cases, but more generally, how do you start weighing the, util the, the lost utility from seeing images versus the gains from having people um, quit, quit cigarettes? That ends the formal presentation. Thank you, Professor Mathias. Such a wealth of information and extremely helpful. And now, Dr. Nardinelli, given your vast regulatory cost and benefit analysis experience, um, could you please share a few thoughts about the study? Just to mention um, that we have already two questions. One participant asked if we could kindly flash a citation to the study so that they can look it up. I'm, I'm sure if they look it up by name, they can. But if you have a citation, maybe Professor Matthews, you can post it and share the screen at some point, or maybe type it in the QA box. The second question from Dr. Eric and is um, related to the a threshold and three-prong uh, Hudson test, but we'll turn to those questions after um, Dr. Nardinelli's intervention. Dr. Nardinelli, please. Thank you. I was pleased to, to see this study. It's to see somebody tackling this uh, difficult question of the effects of graphic warnings um, and particularly looking at the uh, emotional responses in the model of smoking. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor um, Mathias mentioned, we, the, uh, because of the congressional mon mandate, the uh, Food and Drug Administration has been trying to uh, issue graphic warning regulation or to make it effective um, for over 10 years now, and the courts have, have struck it down. Uh, let me also add, though, that the uh, Food and Drug Administration's attempt to regulate, uh, effectively regulate um, uh, tobacco goes back more than three decades. So this is a long-standing, um, difficult problem for the um, regulators. Now, uh, the study that we've just seen um, helps answer two questions, the, the, uh, or the legal question and the economics question. The legal question, as, uh, as, as Alan says, very, very, very difficult and, and tricky. And I'm really not gonna, gonna say very little about that. I'm gonna focus 
on the economics, although it's clear that the economics has uh, great bearing on uh, the, the legal question as well. So from, from my uh, standpoint as a long practitioner of uh, benefit cost analysis, uh, the economics questions are the costs and the benefits of uh, graphic warning labels. Now, uh, let me talk a, a bit uh, just to, to set the stage about the, the costs of labeling. Uh, typically, the, the basic cost of labeling is simply the cost of, I should say, of, of required labeling, is the cost of um, creating and changing the labels. So it's a, it's a one-time fixed cost um, and is typically borne by the producers. Um, there are some other smaller costs, but that's the main thing. But there's also a second cost to labeling that is often ignored, which is that uh, labeling um, is intended to, uh, mini labeling uh, is intended to uh, affect behavior, change behavior. So for example, um, nutrition labeling, uh, an additional cost is the chain, dietary changes and, and consumption changes that people make in response to the labeling. Or if we have a, a over-the-counter pain drug that has directions for use, those directions have to be followed. And that requires a certain amount of time and attention from the actual consumers. This is an additional cost of, of labeling. It's not a, you know, it's not, people don't pay the cost in dollars, but it's an additional cost. Uh, what um, this study sh shows is that there's another type of cost of labeling. And uh, this uh, reminded me very much um, of, of, of a study, a paper a long time ago um, that uh, from Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy on the, um, which, it, which was about the uh, um, cost, or I should say theory of advertising as a good or a bad. Their notion was we look at advertising as a separate product. Com it's a complement to the actual product, but it's, it, it's a, it is in fact a product in its own right. Maybe may be neutral, but it could be a good or a bad. And I think this is what this study is talking about with respect to labeling. Labeling here is a product uh, and it can be a, a good or a bad, meaning it can generate utility or disutility. And clearly, um, graphic warning labels uh, generate disutility. I mean, this is a product that is, it is intended to be complementary packaging with the, actual, uh, with the actual cigarettes, but it is in fact separate. And this disutility is an additional cost. And although they, they've presented just the, the um, discrete choice experiment results here, um, with uh, it will be, it's a fairly simple manner, and I think they describe uh, what they've done that, that it will be possible to actually generate a dollar estimate of, um, uh, of this cost. So, this is a third cost here. So, um, I thought this was this is very diff different. Though. You know, the fear and disgust is in fact a form of you know, a, a uh, that this generates is a cost of this labeling. And of course it leads the, the, all of the costs um, and effects it, shown in the recursive model come from the, these planned uh, behavioral changes, uh, forecast immediate and in the future. Um, see, I, I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to say a little bit uh, about you know, the stated preference study as, as, as Alan noted, uh, particularly with respect to, spoke, to smoking behavior, stated preferences are, are a little, little tricky um, in that smoke, smokers are always planning to quit or planning to change when you ask them. But I think that with the, the actual discrete choice experiment, they've gotten a little bit away. You know, they, I think they've tried to, to 
mitigate that problem pretty well. But um, still, it will be interesting to see the, the further iterations in this study, or as I gather, some of these results that have already been, been carried out, uh, because uh, this is, of course, the question, what will actually, you know, what will these uh, smokers really do in response to these labels? Uh, finally, uh, as the last couple, few slides show, these results are pretty stark. Um, we're getting, um, you know, a really big effect from uh, the fear and disgust, the reaction to the graphic warnings, and very little information effect. And so this is, uh, this is I think, an important finding, uh, and it uh, will have great, great implications uh, that I'm not going to talk about, but are, but are fairly obvious. Um, I also want to just say uh, how pleased I was to see the inclusion of uh, e-cigarettes and vaping in this study, because that's now, you know, a game changer, uh, a major, you know, uh, player in this, in the, in the smoking behavior uh, arena. So I'm glad that was put in. And also uh, just, just to note uh, that uh, all of the other variables, the price variables uh, and so on, all had uh, what I, I would have found the, the expected effects, and that it's always good to see to see things that we we think we know uh, working out in a study. So so this was a very very rich study, and I, I look forward um, seeing a lot more of it. Um, I'm also particularly interested in some of the things that weren't emphasized here, such as the effects on flavors, uh, change, on flavoring changes. Uh, so with that, let me uh, turn it back over to the questioners and again say I think this is a really um, terrific study. It's obviously what we saw is just the tip of the iceberg here in the beginning, so I, I look forward to seeing, seeing more. Thank you, Dr. Nardinelli. And we do have a very interesting question. Um, I believe perhaps Professor Mathias can answer it. It regards the central Hudson test. And uh, just to recap it for those who don't know, it's, it's, it's rather a double test. So there's a threshold prong which says, does the speech concern lawful activity and is it not misleading? And then once that threshold prong has been passed, then there is another um, three other prongs. The government must have a substantial interest, the regulation must directly materially advance the government's substantial interest, and the regula regulation must be narrowly tailored. So it's a form of intermediate scrutiny as opposed to a form of strict scrutiny from a strictly legal point of view. And so the question from Dr. Erickson is, um, given that we universally agree that not smoking combustible cigarettes and, and not starting is, is good for everyone, society and individual, why is Central Hudson in this case or was interpreted in such a way that messages are okay if they inform but not okay if they persuade? I think that's obviously, you know, a simplification for the purpose of the question. Um, so, um, why, you know, why is wording labor that encourages smokers to quit not considered narrowly tailored or narrowly enough tailored? If you wish to maybe share a few of your thoughts and um, reminding you that we are, um, you know, maybe a few minutes away from the end of the um, uh, webinar. So perhaps um, uh, those would be some wrapping comments from Professor Matthias and uh, uh, sure. with many thanks. Sure, so in, in other work I've done, we've tried to like, so that some of the legal questions that came up were is 50 percent the necess the minimum necessary um is that narrowly tailored enough that it has to be 50 percent of the label and so we did studies that moved it to 30 percent of the label do you get similar impacts and so you get into almost this endless negotiation between between the the forced labels and the and the structure of the labels to show what is no more than, the way I interpret narrowly tailored, no more than necessary. And this gets to be fought by in, on so many dimensions of this. And so part of the reason I believe the FDA chose to not focus on the behavioral change in this next round, um, but more on just changing knowledge was to avoid the fights on, oh, does, what it, does it have, does color, is color necessary? Is black and white sufficient? And, you, and so it, it, it becomes very complex 
to argue what is the minimum necessary regulation to ensure the government in, to to secure the government interest. That's that was that that that's about the best I can respond in that quick time. Oh, thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of the webinar. We thank you so much, Professor Mathias and Dr. Nardinelli for participating and for your very insightful comments and presentation. We all encourage, of course, to read the study. And thank you for participating at different times of the day for all of those present. We are really looking forward to um, seeing you and hearing you and getting your questions um, uh, in future webinars. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.